Well, it is the season. The celebrations, everybody's celebrating and in a festive mood. Um, just every, everybody you talk to, they're excited. and Well, most people you talk to are excited. And, and you hear the Christmas songs. And you're out when you're out shopping, and then you get into a place like Walmart, and you almost get run over and trampled to death because people are shopping and trying to get the sales and for presents, and people are thinking about what they're going to get for presents, and then you have a few of them out there drinking and all that different stuff, and then there are some that just say, "This is a great family time at Christmas time." You know, it's interesting, and I did this a little bit this week, I looked back in the origins of Christmas, and it's kind of scary to look back and see where it all originated. Because it comes across as a Catholic tradition of Christ's Mass, but the roots of it are in carnal paganism. It just goes back to all kinds of paganism that was practiced. In fact, there were a couple of gods that, that people worshipped back then that they sacrificed human beings to and they practiced cannibalism. And that was part of the roots of Christmas. Now, they, they kind of mellowed it out and adopted it into Christianity eventually and all that kind of stuff. But it's kind of scary where it comes from, the roots of it. But it is a time when the world, at least as a whole, kind of, like Brock mentioned, reflects a little bit more back on Jesus because it was at one time proclaimed, even though it isn't true, that it was Christ's birthday. And if you look back in history, they will tell you it was more likely in March sometime when he was born, early spring, when the shepherds were getting back out in the field, or early fall, when the shepherds were still able to be out in the field, and it wasn't winter yet. And so maybe somewhere around the middle of September. So, the, But it, the world holds it as Christ's birthday. And so at least they focus a little bit more on Jesus and it's an opportunity for us to reach out with to them with Jesus but for you and I as Christians we know that Christ was born but we celebrate the fact that he was crucified and resurrected and that we can have eternal life with him we can have that new birth and and so we celebrate that together every Sunday and I pray that you celebrate it every day of your life. That Jesus is the Christ. He's the Lord of your life. And yes, we are grateful he was born. Because without that, he couldn't have been sacrificed and resurrected. And so I thought today we'd look a little bit at births. You know, it's an exciting time. The birth of a child. You know, the parents are excited um, we get to watch Eric and Dee go through this whole process as she's pregnant and we get to watch that whole thing and, and they get excited about getting pictures taken of the baby and all of these kinds of things and, and no doubt when the, when the birth of the child comes there will be some really exciting moments and I think probably the grandparents will be excited too. They usually are and, and all of that. But... Um, the birth of a child is really a cheerful time, an exciting time, because a new life comes into the world. A new life is brought into the world, and, and you get to see that life come into the world, and then you get to see that life as it grows in the world. But you realize very soon that it's not all just cheerful, because with the birth of a baby, come some challenges. You know, there's some adjustments that need to be made. You know, when it's just a husband and wife together and they decide, well, tonight we just, well, let's go for supper tonight or well, let's go do this or let's go do that. When a baby comes along, it's not quite that easy to do. You know, when a baby comes along, the first time they get sick, 
the parents are just beside themselves and they're stressed out. You know, after after two or three, well, then it's like, oh yeah, they get sick and they get better and it's all okay and don't worry about it. But, but these challenges come with the birth that they're going to get sick or they might get hurt. And you don't want them to get hurt. I mean, you don't want them to break bones. That's terrible. And and you don't you don't want them to to um, lose a limb or something. And so you protect them, and you go through this whole mother and father protecting the child thing. And and yet you you know that you have to give them some room to grow and to learn and experience. And so. Parenting has taken on all kinds of reactions to these challenges. Some parents will just let their kids go and do whatever. Other parents will protect them a lot, not let them do anything. But you've got to find a balance in there. And there will be some sleepless nights, you know, when the baby's sick and crying. And you're going to have that. And so that's a challenge that comes along with it. And every once in a while, as that child grows, you'll experience some heartaches. And oh yeah, there's that W word too. It's called worry. Is there any parents in here that have never worried about their children? We all do, don't we? We worry about it. Even if it's silly to worry because we know we can't change the outcome where they're at or what they're doing necessarily. But it's just something because we care for them. And so there's some challenges. And there's some changes that come along in family when, when there's a new birth. Routines change. You just can't keep doing the same things. You got, you've got to um, look after the baby now. And so you've got to consider the baby in when you're doing things. You know, you've got to pack them up, put them in the car every time you go somewhere. Or, you know, they're just one thing after the other. So changes are come along. And then there's that responsibility. Ooh, you're responsible for that baby. You know, I, I was reading a story um, just this week, and this young girl wanted to have a baby, and she, she went to her parents and she said, I want to have a baby, and I'm sleeping with my boyfriend, and, and we're going to have a baby. And they said, no, 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 honey, you're way too young, and you're not married. And they tried to do all the reasoning with her. And she was beside herself. She wanted to have a baby. She wanted to experience having a baby. And so the father said, Okay, sit down with me for a minute. And he started talking about providing for the baby and caring for the baby and all of these responsibilities that come with the baby. And guess what her response was? Oh no, I don't want any of that. I just want to have a baby. And unfortunately, that's sometimes where the world's at. They don't realize the responsibility that comes along with having a baby. And so there's, there's some changes happen in the family. Well, there was a birth 2,000 years ago that there was some serious cheerfulness about. You know, um, Elizabeth, she was up there in age and she got pregnant. And uh, she was pretty excited about that. But... Um, her husband was a, a priest at, at the temple and he was serving there and he gets a message from God that this was going to be the one that went before the Lord, the coming of the Lord. He was going to make the path straight and all of those things that the scripture talks about. And so it was kind of exciting. And then... Mary, a relative of hers, gets pregnant. But she hasn't slept with a man. And you can imagine all of the things that went along with that and all of the thoughts they were having and, and everything. But, but an angel talks to Mary. And Mary is excited. This new birth, and it's going to be the Savior of the world and, and all of those things. And then Joseph, he kind of gets miffed. He says, how does she get pregnant? And then the angel talks to Joseph, and he gets it in order too, and he figures, gets it all sorted out. And so there are some really kind of exciting times and kind of times of like questioning and wondering what's going on exactly. But then 
they have to go down and have a census taken. And so they have to go back to Joseph's hometown. And they have to walk all the way to Bethlehem or ride on camels or whatever they did. But they got to make this journey. And Mary's pregnant. That'd be a tough journey. But they were excited to go because they were having a baby. And, and then they get down there and the wise men come. And there's, there's these people talking about Jesus. And, and, and it's just really exciting. And of course, it even got the king's attention. And so it was a pretty cheerful time for them. But shortly after the birth, the challenges began. Because the king's attention was not good. The king wanted to kill the baby. That would be a challenge. Can you imagine someone wanting to kill your baby just after it's born? I can't imagine. And so along with that, with that challenge, came the challenge of sojourning. They had to run all the way to Egypt. Now you've got to understand, they didn't jump on an airline on a plane and fly over to Egypt. They didn't drive there on paved roads. They walked and they rode on camels with a newborn baby through desert land all the way to Egypt. That would have been a challenge. It wouldn't have been easy. And sometimes we think we have it rough. But they had some challenges to face. Then they had to face the idea of living as a foreigner with a newborn baby in a foreign country. A country that didn't just all that willingly accept them. And so they had these challenges. And the baby grew and they moved back. They had to move back. And they went through some challenges through his childhood. They even experienced losing him one time and then finding him days later in the temple. And so they had some challenges as he was growing up after this birth. But a lot of things changed with that birth. You know, as he grew and he became a man, people started realizing that there was something special about Jesus. They realized that at 12 years old when he was in the temple, they said, man, how does he know this stuff? And he's answering the teachers. And he's telling the teachers. And they're going, whoa, where did he get this knowledge from and this wisdom? But then things really started to change when he started his ministry. Teaching changed. It went from Rabbi so-and-so saying this and that to Jesus saying, I tell you. And they said, whoa, and people rejected it. And they didn't want that. And John said that he came full of grace and truth. You see, it changed from the Mosaic law to the law of grace in Jesus Christ. And, and people couldn't handle it. That was just too much change. And they, they balked at that change. And they fought it. And they resisted. And the covenant changed too. In fact, there's a whole new covenant established. It's interesting. Attitudes. Jesus taught about attitudes. And that was a huge change. Because he came and he said that the Pharisees weren't getting into the kingdom unless they repented. And the people said, man, if they're not getting in, those holy people, if they're not getting in, who's going to get in? And Jesus taught about, don't look at the outside. Check what's on the inside. Check the heart. It doesn't matter what's done unless it's done from the heart. And so a lot of things changed. Truth was taught. They thought they had truth, but they didn't have all the truth. And the truth was taught. Authority changed. The Pharisees wanted to hang on to their authority, an authority they had themselves given, but God hadn't given. And they wanted to hang on to that. 
And they couldn't. And they didn't realize, it didn't matter how much they resisted, they weren't going to. They weren't going to hang on. Because Jesus was all authority. And Jesus was the king. Now they were expecting a Messiah, but they had formulated in their minds the idea of what the Messiah should be. And Jesus didn't fit that. And so even that changed. And so there were a lot of changes happened. Jesus was now the king. And the second birth that we often just overlook that happened in the New Testament was the birth of a new kingdom. Of course, we couldn't have had the birth of a new kingdom without the birth of Jesus and without the death of Jesus. Because the, the Hebrew writer says that for a will to be enacted, there has to be the death of the mediator. So Jesus had to die to enact the new covenant or to establish his new kingdom. And so we have the birth of a kingdom. Jesus talked about it. He said, it is at hand. It is close. It is near. And Acts 2, the kingdom doors, the new kingdom doors are opened up. And there is so much excitement. And so the people are so happy and cheerful because of this new kingdom, because they have salvation and they can be part of this new kingdom. So its birth brought excitement. And there's lots of cheering. Talk about excitement. There were people thrown in jail. There were miracles being done. It would have been an exciting time to be living then. And then... In Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch. He says, I want to be part of that kingdom. I want to be added to that kingdom. And he gets all excited. And he says, there's water. What stops me from being baptized? What stops me from joining that kingdom? And 3,000 people were added the first day to that kingdom. And soon it was 5,000 and, and more and more and more. And you know, the one thing that we do with births is we take pictures and we take things and, and we keep little things. And we, and some people keep a, a scrapbook that they put little mementos in and stuff and you save the, the cute little shoes that they wore the first time and, and all of those things. Well, you know what? We got a whole bunch of keepsakes from the birth of the kingdom right here. All of those neat little mementos of the birth of the kingdom. But with that birth came challenges. There was fierce opposition. There was a lot of suffering. <clears throat> the challenges were tough. It often cost people their lives to be part of that new kingdom or to stand for that new kingdom. And some of the other challenges that came with that new kingdom, Jesus said to love your enemies. Who ever heard of loving their enemies? That's not what you did with enemies. You destroyed your enemies so that they couldn't get you. That's, that's the mentality, isn't it? But Jesus said, no, it's going to be tough being part of this new kingdom. There's going to be some challenges because I require you to love your enemies. And then he said, and don't reward evil with evil, but reward it with good. Do you know how hard it is when someone is practicing wickedness against you to do good for them? That's not easy. That's a challenge. And then Jesus said, oh, and there's another thing. And this is going to be a tough challenge for you. He said, it's not about self. It's not about you. What? But I want to be part of the kingdom. He said, no, 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 it's not about you. You can be part of the kingdom, but it's about the kingdom. And everyone 
in the kingdom. And so you need to deny self and follow Christ. And believe me, in the first century, that was a challenge. Maybe not so much today, but if you do really follow Christ, it can still be a challenge today. Because if you're not challenged, you may have to revisit that and see if you're following Christ as he wants you to. And it's not about your will. It's about the will of God. That means we have to deny ourselves, sacrifice ourselves to the will of God. But he says, I promise you, you get through those challenges. And he said, you will find some really good change. That's what will happen. And, and things really change because everybody in Jesus' day was focused on the physical. They wanted to be delivered from the slavery or enslavement of Rome. And he said, I'm here to deliver you from so much more. More than you can imagine. Because I'm here to deliver your soul from the penalty of sin. That's a change. He says, it's not about the physical in and of itself anymore. It's about the spiritual. And when you get the spiritual right, the physical will fit right in. It'll be fine. You don't have to worry about the physical. Because if you're spiritually right, you'll be okay. You'll do the right things. And so it's about the spiritual. It's about an eternal kingdom. Not a kingdom on earth. People still talk about Jesus coming back and reigning on earth in a kingdom and establishing a kingdom on earth. Why would he do that when he's already established his kingdom in heaven? There's no more need of a kingdom here for him. He's calling us to his kingdom in heaven. And so he said, it's about the eternal kingdom, about eternity with God, about being my nation of people. Not Canadian, not American, not Chinese or Russian, not African, not any of those, not anything. It's about being Christian, about being a disciple of Christ, being his nation of people, blood purchased on the cross. Well, like with all births, some people don't like the challenges. And some people don't want the change. But, you know, we need to accept the change and the challenges. Jesus' birth isn't even recorded as a date in Scripture. In fact, it's not recorded anywhere in the world. We don't have a record of it. And you have to ask yourself, why? If it was all that important, God probably would have recorded it for us so we could know. But it wasn't. But it's not that we don't want to celebrate his birth, because without his birth, there'd be no salvation. Without his birth, we would be lost. And so it's okay to ponder on it. I would suggest not getting hung up on it. But what we ought to rejoice in is that he came up out of that grave and the birth of his kingdom. Because his kingdom can be exciting for us. It's a new life. It's an et we have an eternal king with an eternal kingdom. No one will claim victory over him. We live in the kingdom that wins. And that's it. And that should be celebrated every day. Do you realize how many kingdom privileges you and I have every day? Every day here on earth. And how much more in eternity. We should rejoice over those things. We should celebrate it. And we even know the date that the kingdom was established in Acts chapter 2. But we can celebrate it 
because we can be part of that kingdom. We have all the keepsakes. And 2,000 years after the birth, we can have, we can rejoice in being part of that kingdom. I don't know if you've ever thought of the kingdom as being a new birth, but it is. And Jesus said, I established it so you could be part of that kingdom. And so if you're here this morning and you're not part of that kingdom, I would encourage you to become part of that kingdom. Find out what it means to, or what you have to do to become part of that kingdom and rejoice in eternity with the rest of us. If we can serve you in any way, we invite you to come forward now while we stand and sing. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble glow? Why did He choose a lowly birth? Because He loved me so. Because He loved me so.